All of us are actually heading off on aeroplanes to get back to Australia after the, the presentation today. I was just having a chat with some people outside and they have lined up at, and I haven't managed to get here yet, out to the famous Ruffles Hotel to get themselves a Singapore sling, but apparently they're lined up for about an hour and a half, so they're a little bit hot and sweaty outside. But you've made the right decision because you're here to, to hear about a very unique project. We're going to talk about green critical minerals. They're developing the Macintosh graphite deposit, which is in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. It's one of Australia's largest and highest purity graphite deposits. It has proven attributes that make it suitable for the EV battery market. I'd like you all please to give a very warm welcome to the newly minted CEO, Mark Lynch Staunton, who's going to tell us about this project, which is unique for a number of reasons. You've only been in this role for 30 days, haven't you, Mark? That's right, Chrissy. Welcome and uh, best of luck today. Thanks, Chrissy. Look, it's, it's great to be here. I'm absolutely thrilled to tell you about the Macintosh Graphite Deposit in Western Australia. Great to be back in Singapore, day two of the conference, last panel, thanks for sticking around. Look, I've listened to fantastic presentations all throughout the day, but I believe we've we've saved the best to last. So I'm gonna explain why green critical minerals should be part of your investment portfolio. It's click, it's not working. Usual disclaimer, it's on the website. Okay, investment highlights. Macintosh is already the third largest uh, graphite deposit in Australia, but we're not going to stop there. We've got plenty of room to grow. Where you operate is vital. Uh, you can't get any better than Western Australia. We're a global mining powerhouse, low to no sovereign risk. Flake size is also super important. And we've got some of the largest flake in Western Australia. It attracts a significant premium. Purity is also key. A clean and easy to purify graphite is one of the key differentiating factors and outweighs other mining metrics such as grade. Finally, graphite is indeed a critical mineral. It's one of the pillars to the EV revolution and graphite is essential to meeting the world's decarbonization goals. I'd like to highlight our market cap here, just over 12 million, 4.4 in the bank, leaving an enterprise value of 8.2, which ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, makes GCM one of the best and undervalued ASX listed graphite stocks out there. It's an attractive entry level um, evaluation compared to our peers, but this is not gonna last long. We've got a huge pipeline of news coming up uh, to reaffirm Macintosh as a serious graphite player. Let me introduce you to our, our team first. We've put together one of those dream teams, to put it bluntly, experience board and management team with several studies underneath their belt. Let me point out this one gentleman in particular, Michael Hughes, he's just joined us. He's a veteran study manager. He's just completed the DFS of the significant Manoa a lithium project in the DRC. It's the world's largest. He's passionate about ESG and he's looking forward to the challenge of delivering Australia's first net zero graphite mine. We're rounded out by an A-list advisory team. We're lucky to have these guys on board and it speaks volumes uh, to the, the quality and the potential of the Macintosh project. Right, I love presenting this slide. It makes things really clear. Graphite is and will continue to be the dominant material across all commercial battery technologies. The market's been obsessed with lithium, nickel, cobalt, but now it's time for graphite to shine. So you need to be aware there's, there's two types of graphite, natural flake, which is, uh, which is at Macintosh and synthetic. So synthetics made from the waste product from the oil industry, they get this needle coke and they heat it up to 3000 degrees for up to three weeks. So already taking a, a very high intensive carbon footprint product and making it 10 times worse. You can see on the, on the left, today natural graphite supplies 39% of the demand for, for batteries. However, this is set to change. Benchmark Mineral Intelligence has forecasted the natural will displace synthetic. Why? Natural, natural graphite is half the cost of synthetic. Two, it's 10 times less carbon footprint. And three, the European legislation is, is, is legislating that we have to put the carbon footprint on the battery. And if we're putting synthetic graphite into our battery, we're, we're, we're going to blow out those metrics.
supply and demand. And to meet this demand, we're going to need several graphite mines to come online. In fact, based on the average graphite mine of 55,000 tonnes uh, per annum, benchmark is forecasted, we're going to need 97 natural flake graphite mines built by 2035. So graphite requires the largest production increase of any of the battery uh, minerals. So as EV adoption grows, so will the demand for graphite. There's over 300 uh, battery factories in the, in the pipeline uh, globally, but not enough graphite to, su to supply them. But here's the thing, not all graphite mines are created equal, and there'll be some mines that won't be able to meet the specifications of the EV battery market. This is truly critical. The correct natural graphite is therefore absolutely vital to this EV revolution and our climate change goals. So what's currently happening to the graphite price? Why hasn't it been following lithium yet? Well, all evidence points to that it's just about to. So when the battery market demand captured between 40 and 60% of the lithium supply, it triggered a huge 1,300 price increase. Similar thing happened to cobalt we saw a 347% price increase. So critically, the battery market has just reached that 50% uh, level of, of graphite supply. So if we go by what happened to lithium and cobalt, we're expecting a dramatic increase in, in the graphite price. In fact, we've already started to see this. We've had a 56% increase in the fines graphite price since uh, September, 2021, which has outperformed gold and base metals. Okay, introducing you to the Macintosh project. First off, it's in Australia. This is just one of our unique selling points. You, you can't beat this. Most of the new supply is coming out of, uh, from East Africa. With green critical minerals, uh, we've got, we've got the, this, the low sovereign operating risk of Western, in Western Australia. You, you just can't beat this compared to, to East Africa. Also, this is critical for mineral offtake agreements. They need to see that stability. We couldn't ask for a better setup here. We're 12 kilometres off the Great Northern Highway. It's a sealed road, one of Australia's, uh, Western Australia's main road, short distance to the port of Wyndham, easy access to the Asian markets. And to top it off, we've got access to some of the purest energy out there. It's hydroelectricity from, from Lake Argyle. I'd like to point out that Macintosh has already had a PFS back in 2017. It showed positive economics with an NPV over 250 million. However, the market wasn't there for graphite at that point. Market sentiment has, however, changed, and we're excited to be building on this previous work. So we're looking to update the PFS with new price models, new graphite processing technology, and ultimately, we intend to be the lowest capex startup on the ASX, which is going to set us apart. Just a quick view of the Emperor deposit. Uh, very simple, open pit mining low strip ratio, this is what's going to keep mining costs down. So what makes Macintosh graphite special? We've got, we've got three things that we're going to go through here. But let me first start off by saying graphite deposits are not credit equal. Just a quick, quick education piece on graphite. Unlike gold and base metals, factors like grade uh, really take a back seat. Graphite is all about flake quality, impurity levels, and flake size distribution. And I'm gonna let you into a secret today, Macintosh has them all in spades. So first up, crystallinity. I can't stress how important crystallinity is. It's, it's one of these, it's, it's the factor that prevents the majority of natural flake graphites actually making it into the battery sector. We had preliminary test work done on Macintosh graphite that showed it was near perfect hexagonal structure. So what, what does this actually mean? Well, it, it, crystallinity gives you capacity. And in the case of Macintosh, the test work showed that we, we, we achieved near theoretical capacity uh, for the battery market. This is rare in natural flake uh, graphite deposits, making Macintosh a highly desirable product. Purification. Purification is key. Uh, it's one of the most cost intensive processes in the graphite industry. So if you're able to process your graphite easily, you're gonna save a lot, which is of course good for the business, but it's also better for the environment because we're gonna be using uh, less energy. 
So Macintosh graphite, the impurities are hosted on the outside of the flake, which allows this easy and light purification method. This will allow Macintosh to be in the lowest quartile purification costs uh, globally. Other graphite deposits, the impurities are locked inside the, the flake, and that makes it really tricky and expensive uh, to remove those impurities. Also, the fact that uh, Macintosh was able to achieve 99.999% impurity means it qualifies as nuclear grade purity, uh, which fetches up to 30,000 USD per ton. So high value graphite plus low purification costs equals high margins. Lastly, flake size distribution. So preliminary test work shows that up to 85% of the emperor deposit at Macintosh is coarse flake. Coarse flake attracts a significant premium. Coarse flake is also very important for mine economics. Standalone graphite operations who only rely on lower value fine flake may not be economic. Coarse flake markets are also in demand and I'm, I'll take you through some of that on the, on the next slide. So there are many markets for coarse flake, but I'm just going to focus on two that we're, we're targeting. Uh, coarse flake is suitable to make expandable graphite. This is a huge growth market with prices fetching between four and 6,000 uh, USD per ton. It's used as a flame retardant in building materials. And critically, the Chinese government has mandated flame retardant has to be used in all new building materials. So there's a, there's a huge growth market there. Secondly, we have graphite foil, uh, huge demands from the electronics industry. It's used in our iPhones, Samsung tablets, uh, and it's used as a thermal management because nothing can beat the, the properties of graphite as, as, as a heat conductor. Then lastly, a real growth story here is the hydrogen fuel cell industry. There's a significant amount of graphite foil that goes into the hydrogen fuel cell. And in fact, the United States Geological Survey has been quoted in saying that fuel cells have the potential to almost consume as much graphite as all other uses combined. So to top it off, the lack of availability of coarse flake, which the majority was coming out of China, that they're running out of this coarse flake. So that's really pushing up demand for these products. As I mentioned earlier, Macintosh is already Australia's third largest uh, graphite resource. Uh, we've got 1.1 million tons of contained graphite, but not stopping there. It's a very large tenement package with geophysics clearly showing huge expansion potential. So our current resource is, is highlighted in red and everything else highlighted in yellow is an expiration target. Um, and so we could, we've got an expiration target uh, out there that could potentially quadruple our resource. So our first drilling program is is next month and i'm excited to uh and looking forward to sharing the results with you okay milestones for 2023 are very clear we want to complete the drilling program and expand the resource we've already got a significant amount of diamond core available from the previous pfs so we're going to focus on revalidating the flotation test work. We'll create a, a master flotation concentrate and we'll be sending that concentrate off to all the major battery anode producers to test their technology and qualify for, for, for their batteries. So by Q1 next year, we're aiming to deliver the upstream PFS. And also in parallel, we, we also aim to deliver the scoping study for this battery anode uh, material so every step of the way here is is a, is a value add journey and i look forward to updating you with with progress okay ladies and gents this is the the wrap up here taking you through the key points so macintosh graphite it's in that tier one mining jurisdiction that's our unique uh, selling point here in australia you can't beat that low to no sovereign risk We've got that expansion potential that I've just showed you about. We've got the potential to quadruple our resource. It's already uh, it's already an established resource, but uh, we can get up to 4 million tons of contained graphite. Uh, we've also got the quality. So we've got the, we've got the purity, we've got the crystallinity, and we've got the correct coarse uh, and fine flake needed for the, uh, for the battery industry. And lastly, we've got that clear business strategy. Uh, gonna deliver that PFS at the end of the year and and the downstream um, scoping study also by the end of the year so 
look, that's Macintosh in 15 minutes. I'm happy to speak to any of you afterwards to, to, to go through any further details. Look, if you want to talk to me about the best graphite investment opportunity at rock bottom prices, then I'm more than happy to take you through it. But uh, it's not hanging around here for long. This, this, this stock will be taking off soon. Thanks, everyone. And uh, look, great to be back in Singapore. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of the, uh, the global decarbonization effort. Thanks very much. Great presentation. Thanks very much, Mark Internet. Um, green Critical Minerals, uh, code GCM, if you're interested in that one. We have got, what have we got? One, two, three, four more companies for you to have a look at. And then we've got our panel, our final panel. And we're looking at rare earths diversifying supply. And then we've got our conference cocktails. You are waiting in the wings there, aren't you? Why don't you whip up here right now? We're gonna, we've, we've talked about the importance of renewable resources. We continue to talk about it. And an observation that's made by many of us is that our solar panels and our wind turbines aren't particularly green if we have to keep on replacing them. So we need to prolong the life of our renewables, our renewable energy sources. And that's where zinc comes in. And that's where Rumble Resources come in because Rumble Resources is developing the emerging energy sources or the world-class Irrahidi Zinc Project, which is in the Irrahidi Basin in Western Australia. And to tell us more, would you please make, welcome their MD, Shane Sikora. Shane, welcome. Thank you very much, Chrissy, for that introduction. And uh, very excited to be here for this new Singapore conference. And I appreciate you all making the effort to hear the exciting story. So what are Rumble's value drivers? We are 18 months on from a major discovery and we believe we have an emerging world-class zinc lead discovery. To date, we found over um, 19 kilometers of zinc lead mineralization, which is zinc sulfide dominant. It's flat lying, uh, shallow and op open in all directions. And that lends itself to a large scale, low cost open pit mining proposition in the world-class mining jurisdiction of Western Australia. Our initial exploration target was 40 million tonnes, but we quickly upgraded that to 100 to 120 million tonnes at 3.5 to 4.5% uh, zinc lead sulphide, and that would get us into the giant category. Um, what we've also found is um, high-grade, well-defined zones going kilometres with 5 to 8% in these high-grade feeder zones. Now, that will be the focus of our drawing as we um, continue to drill out our resource resources, I should say, and any new discoveries. And today we've tested less than a third of our 45 kilometer Navajo unconformity unit, which hosts that um, the high grade or the resources. And we also haven't tested any of the mineralized um, underground uh, geological units um, targeting MVT. So that gives us the potential for provincial scale tier one scale deposits. And it also gives us the potential for exceptional potential to increase that 300 million tons, which then gets you into that super giant category for expanding known resources and through new discoveries. And like any good discovery, you want to make sure you have some excellent metallurgy. And that's what we had at the back end of last year. We managed to find high recoveries and marketable constant drain grades, which support a potential low capex and low opex operation. Um, and what's exciting right now is that we've done all the hard work over the last two years to now be able to work towards our maiden jort resource. And uh, that's going to be sooner rather than later. And we believe we'll have one of the largest undeveloped zinc deposits in the world at that point in time. So watch this space. Um, in the back end of last year, we also intersected high-grade copper, and that was a, a separate mineralization event to the zinc lead. So we do also have that, the, the potential for independent copper deposits throughout the course of the project. Now, if this all comes together, it gives us the potential for a multi-commodity cycle asset, which gets you in that tier, tier one uh, category. Now, like any good company that makes a discovery, we've been actively uh, growing our high caliber team and we've got a great team, uh, six, has a six, successful track record of making major discoveries and um, mine development. Here's just a bit of a snapshot of our corporate overview, um, circa 140 mil market cap at this point in time, uh, nine and a half in the bank into the last quarterly. We've got, um, got uh, Bradley Watson from Bal Bal Potter doing some great research on the company. I think like most companies in the last sort of nice months, there's been a bit of an instability in the markets, but it seems to be uh, flattening off here. But we think once you listen to the story today, you can see why we could actually have significant market cap and share price increase as we head towards that maiden resource. Building a team is really important. 
We've got Brett Keelor, Head of Technical, twice AMAC Prospect of the Year, once for Tropicana and one for Plutonic. We've got a series of really experienced geologists that have actually made discoveries and done feasibility in their own rights. We just introduced Peter Venn, who's put 10 mines into production across Africa and Australia. We brought on Jeff Jones, who's an engineer who was the XMD for geoengineering, one of the premium mine builders in Western Australia. Of recent, we brought on Trevor Hart, who was the CFO of Develop, who was instrumental in actually acquiring the Woodlawn Zinc Mine and, and uh, getting $400 million in underground mining contract services. So we have the team to deliver this asset, but we're not going to stop from here. We're going to continue to grow and expand that board and management team as we head towards that development phase. So where is it located? We made this discovery in April 2021 in the in the Hiriiti Basin. It's about um, 100 uh, kilometres north of Waluna. And through ex ex exceptional exploration, we found over 19 kilometres of mineralisation. And this project is zinc sulphide dominant, so it's up to 10 to 1. This is a zinc discovery. And as I mentioned before, we've tested less than a third of the strike that's already hosted this significant mineralisation. There's never been a better time to find zinc. It's uh, going to play a critical role in the low carbon economy, but in particular, it's critical mineral for the renewable energy storage. So it's critical for your wind, uh, wind turbines and uh, solar panels and some of the battery materials as well. So what is the forecast zinc production and future supply deficit looking, looking like? Well, zinc inventories are at uh, historic lows. Four of the 10 uh, major producers are running out of ore in the next 10 years. And you can see the depletion sort of drops off a cliff in 2030. And you can see, um, if you look at the forecast by 2040, uh, a major amount of production capacity is required. And if you start factoring in South 32's climate change scenario, it almost doubles again. So what that says to us is it needs new discoveries and new mines to come into production. So what's going to fuel that gap? We believe Irahidi is a globally significant zinc discovery. Our initial exploration target gets us into that giant category, which is pretty rare air. Um, and that's going to be an open pit scenario. Like globally, 8% of uh, mines are open pit, uh, which are much uh, significantly lower mining costs. Um, what we also have, whilst we have the open pitable 3.5% to 4.5% um, zinc lead, we have that potential to find high grade underground in the, the lower geological units where we're getting up to 10% already. And just for a bit of a, an idea of what one of these projects is worth, um, South 32 purchased the Hermosa deposit uh, four years ago. It was a 120 million tonne zinc lead deposit for over $2 billion Australian. We're currently 120 mil market cap about to announce our maiden resource. So you can see why we're excited about getting that out and a major milestone for the company. This here is just giving you a bit of a schematic of what the uh, mineralisation is doing. And if you look at the middle, middle, uh, the middle uh, mineralisation feeder fault, mineralisation passes up through um, geological formations four and five. We're targeting number one. And that's the, um, uncon um, the unconformity unit. You're finding big bits of mineralization, much higher grades. And as you get further away, the grades decrease. But because we've got a whole um, series of these feeder zones, they um, le um, link up like a coal seam. Hence why we're getting these big mineralization units. What we um, noticed at the back end of last year, Strickland Minerals hit that target four, um, which is two geological units below the no mineralization, where we could actually find high grade, high angle mineralization. Now that hasn't been tested to date, and it's just another exciting element for the project. This here starts to give you a bit of a, an idea of the provincial scale potential for the project. So today we found eight kilometers at the Chinook Prospect, which is open in all directions and will form part of our maiden resource. We found 11 Ks by 2 Ks at the Tonkin Navajo Prospect, which is open in all directions. Just recently, we've identified um, soil sampling techniques and uh, gravity targeting that actually suggest we can start to identify these beta targets all the way down the Navajo Southeast trend, which has been untested, and another 12 kilometers across the Sweetwater trend. Now, whilst we've got 45 Ks of this strike, we've also got the Iroquois unit two layers below that have not been tested as well. So we are literally just at the tip of the iceberg of uncovering what this project could be. We're now starting to zoom into the Chinook prospects. And what you can see here in the red is those feeder targets. Two of those, there's the Chicken and the Calatan, which are over two kilometers long. And as I said before, whilst we're targeting the three and a half to four and a half percent, within those feeder zones, you're getting eight meters at 14, six meters at 11%. You're getting uh, 19 meters at six. So the grade significantly increased within those feeder zones. But what it actually lends itself to is a big mineralization envelope that could be open pitable. 
This a particular area is three to one zinc to lead ratio, but it actually has a high vertical content per vertical meter. And this will form the basis of our, one of our maiden resources. Eight kilometers down to the south, we've got the Tonka Navajo project. Now at the Chinook Prospect, we're seeing north-south feeder structures. We tried to apply the same method to the Tonka um, Navajo region with, with um, not a lot of success. And then once we started to identify that these feeder zones were east-west in the gravity, we've now found a whole stack of these feeders all the way down the Tonka Navajo trend. And you can see there the Calatan, the Colorado feeder zones over you know, 2.4 kilometers long, five minutes at 14%, three minutes at 20, three minutes at 12, you know, significantly higher grades within those feeder zones. So today we're going to be you know, focusing on the resources at the Tonka and the Navajo, but you can see there's some broad space drilling in and around those prospects. So there's a lot of potential to grow and expand on those first resources. In this particular area, the resources are up to 10 to 1. So this is very zinc dominant in this particular region. This here just gives you a bit of a snapshot of what a, a section looks like. We're targeting the mineralization starting at 40 meters, which is the sulfide. The, the dip's about three degrees. So you can see where there's those multiple um, feeder zones pushing the mineralization up, making them join up like a coal seam, if I want for a better word. Above the mineralization, uh, above the mineralization is the oxidized iron sequence, which is um, uh, very soft. It gives itself the potential for a low cost um, waste removal scenario. But what that um, iron oxide also does is actually mask any soil sampling. So if you try to soil sample across that uh, iron oxide horizon, it doesn't showcase anything. What we're seeing though, in the up dip position where it does daylight, which is not our target, it does start to showcase what could be below. So if you look at this schematic here, you'll see the Tonka and Navajo region, and there's a big mineralization footprint, as I said before, which will be part of that um, our maiden resources. You'll see the soil sampling to the west of the mineralization, and that's the up dip position. What that's saying to us is if you get that tenor of mineralization in the soils, it does suggest there could be some good mineralization down at depth. We've also flown the airborne gravity, and you can see in those gravity lows at the Colorado and magazine, magazine feeder zones that they do showcase the, um, where the feeder zones are. So those gravity lows are important. So we've now done the soil sampling along the Navajo Southeast trend. And we found, if not the same, if um, better um, tenor in the soils than at the Tonka, we suggest the mineralization could be there at depth. And you can also now start to see there's another eight or nine uh, feeder zones that are yet to be tested. Now we're getting our heritage clearance there done at the moment. And that's a pretty exciting um, scenario for us to you know, double where we are at the moment with the Tonka. Like any good discovery, you want to ensure you get great metallurgy. And we had some excellent results at the back end of last year. We got high zinc recoveries to 90% in the concentrates. We have coarse grind up to 150 micron. We've got fast flotation with clean sulfide using salt water, um, site water, which is important. And that lends itself to a simple and conventional process flow sheet that could supply us with a low capex op, um, OPEX scenario. Now, the zinc concentrate grades to 59% is um, highly marketable, and it's at the higher end of global benchmark to current developers, and you'll see that in uh, the table below. But there's also considerable potential to optimize that metallurgy through um, various scenarios along with beneficiation. So what we got here is uh, the potential beneficiation, which is through DMS and all sorting. But this is just simply a value add to the project. This is simply a cost effective way of sorting the waste to the ore. And you can see the MVT scenario that we have. Um, lends itself well to um, increase. And some of the ones you can see examples there are four times uplift in head grade and up to eight times head, um, head grade uplift along with 80% waste removal, which actually gives you the potential for that low capex opex scenario. Um, you know, we're just at the early stage of trying to understand this copper, which is obviously important uh, for the future. Um, we've been doing uh, vertical holes. Um, so hence, looking for flat line mineralization, this copper is actually in a vertical structure. So we're pretty unlikely, unlikely to hit that. But when you look at the regional perspectivity, you've already got the Degrissa and the Theduna um, the copper deposits. So there is that potential for that within the project. And we're just at the early stage of understanding that. Sustainability is a really important part for us. Uh, we like to engage with our local stakeholders, in particular the Native, Native Total Group, where we have a really strong relationship as we move forward and we incorporate best practice uh, environmental principles as well. Now, now to the near-term catalysts at Irahidi. As I mentioned before, a major milestone's upon us, which is gonna be our maiden uh, resource estimate. And what's exciting about that resource is it's just a start because we've tested less than 35% of that, but we still think it will be one of the biggest undeveloped zinc deposits in the world. 
Our drilling is going to focus um, on expanding on known resources um, throughout the course of the year. But one of the really exciting elements is targeting that Navajo Southeast trend where we found a whole series of new feeders that have not been tested to date. And we also look to target that copper um, dominant system. And one of the last but not least things is the flotation optimization and the beneficiation techniques for the project. So all in all, one of the largest undeveloped zinc deposits in the world, um, expansion potential is significant to potential supergiant and a very exciting time for shareholders. So I appreciate your time today. Thanks very much, Jay. well done. Graphite, zinc, now it is time for copper to take centre stage here at Future Facing Commodities. Copper is vital in the drive to the Electrify Modern Society. We're going to introduce you to the team at Austral Resources Australia Limited, who are actively engaged in mining and producing 99.99% pure LME grade A copper cathode and they were very well positioned for future growth they've got a substantial 2,000 kilometers square or square kilometers of exploration tenure I haven't even got to the drinks yet and I already sound like my teeth are out excuse me a substantial 2,000 square kilometers of exploration tenure and it's all in very highly promising territory uh, this gentleman up here goes by the name of Dan Johnson who also goes by the titles of managing director and CEO, and he's here today to share with us the story and the future chapters of Austral. Please make him welcome.
Wow. Sometimes it's easier to show than to tell. There's a, there's, there is a misconception uh, as to who Austral is and what we're about. And we thought we'd take a, a platform like this just to kind of put it out there so you can really see it. It's been a long day. Firstly, uh, thank you for everyone still being that are still here. Uh, I realise there's only a few presenters between you and a cold tiger beer, so I will now keep this as uh, short and concise as I can. For those who don't know us, we're located 120 kilometres northwest of Mount Isa, sitting up in, that, in the heart of that base metals and copper district. One point I want to draw your attention to with that video, and again, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a misconception. There were only two items on that video that are not our operation, and that was the solar farm and the wind farm. Everything else, we are a producing and an operational copper mine growing. I've just carted a 99.9% .9 pure plate of copper cathode all the way to Singapore, uh, you know, to show that this is exactly what we do. We don't produce, we don't make a concentrate. Uh, we produce a copper cathode, 99.9% .9 pure. Now, if anyone really wants to negotiate and try and buy that off me later on, I would appreciate it. So I don't have to cart it all the way home. It's about 30 kilos. So just to recap that video, um, we have a $400 million uh, processing facility there. So a lot of assets uh, and in a replacement value. Um, and to do that, you know, to sit there and go and replace something like that in today's uh, environment, you, you know, to, you'd be looking at a four to five year process going through your permitting and approvals. We have a 180 man camp up on site. Right now we've got 120 staff up there mining. Uh, we've just done we've just done thirty five million dollars worth of revenue for the quarter, so we've really kind of starting to hit our straps and hit our thousand ton a month nameplate production. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. I want to just walk you through, uh, you know, this slide here because it's quite important in showing the history of the asset and how much copper has been mined uh, out of our investment, uh, you know, and and the fact that there's so much more copper to come. There's been over $1 billion worth of copper uh, mined out of this asset over the last 15 years. And that at a, at, a, at a much lower copper price as well. So we're currently mining uh, four of our eight mining leases. The reason why this is really important, there's a significant amount of copper that's been previously mined, but certainly a lot more copper still in the ground uh, that we're going to prove up over the next 18 months. Here we are with our corporate overview. Uh, market cap sitting somewhere around $150 million. Uh, cash at bank at the end of March was around $6 million uh, after paying down some debt. We've got a very tight share register. Uh, top five hold over 55 to 60%. Uh, and most of those in the top five have all increased or been with us since our IPO and they've increased their portfolio uh, since since our listing. Anthill steady state production. Anthill's currently doing a, a thousand ton a month, as I mentioned, of copper cathode. We've got a dual compliant resource of more than 80,000 ton. Our east and west pit contain around 40,000 ton, uh, which we're currently mining in, as in that photo. And I'll touch on later our drilling campaign on Anthill 2.0 and our, where we're going to go and convert you know, some of that resource into a reserve and extend that anthill mine life. Austral Resources is the only operating SXEW oxide plant uh, in Australia currently. There's none of these that are currently producing copper cathode. To build, as I mentioned, to build one of these facilities, you're looking at around $400 million plus uh, in four to five years to go through your permitting approval process. So it's quite a lengthy process. Antil is a, as a snapshot based on today's copper prices, over half a billion in revenue. Um, we put out over the next four years and we put out our uh, last month, I think, or yeah, put out in March our C1 cost. We're currently sitting around $2.76 per pound. I just want to take this quick opportunity to, to, to give a quick shout out to all our contractors and suppliers on site. We've had over one metre of rain since Christmas. 
Um, you know, and the fact that we have been able to continue mining uh, and processing our copper during that period is an absolute testament to, to everyone who's all involved. So big thanks to them. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, focused on the, on the moving forward as we continue to grow, taking those guys along with us. Here's our money slide. I'm, I'm, I'm often asked, you know, where's, where's, where's Austral in 10 years from, where's Austral in 10 years from now? You know, is Austral going to become a, a dividend producing stock? Um, I guess this, this slide here I'm going to walk you through really shows that we've got the runway to be here in 10 years and beyond. Um, I mean, our focus right now is putting all our, our money back in the ground and proving up uh, the fact that we have such a big resource. Our goal is to become one of Australia's best copper producers over the next 10 years. To begin with, we've got a budget of $7 million uh, for this exploration season, and we're going to be drilling 20 to 20, 22 to 23,000 drill metres. Uh, we're actually commencing, uh, even after all the wet, we're commencing drilling um, tomorrow. As you work your way down the page, uh, you can see that we're, our goal is to convert that anthill into a resource and I've got a slide a little bit later that I'll walk you through on that. The other one I want to touch on is Lady Colleen. Uh, we've recently put out a pre-feasibility study on Lady Colleen, uh, and you can see that there in that slide that we're pulling that on um, online next year. Again, that's going to potentially add uh, double our revenue stream. With Antil now at steady state, our other focus is on our existing pits. I mentioned earlier that that uh, you know we've mined four of our eight mining leases. Um, there's been 120,000 tonne of copper cathode mined out of those four pits. And at today's copper prices, we're currently doing a feasibility study, feasibility study with CSA Global. And uh, at this stage, it's showing that we could be able to increase our current production profile by 60 to 70%. We're probably a week or two away from having all the, the economics and the final figures on that, but uh, it's certainly shaping up that, yeah, we, we, could be, we can be certainly putting a lot more feed through our plant. You know, I don't know whether I mentioned it earlier in, in that slide, but that processing facility of ours is the absolute Taj Mahal. Um, it's capable of 30,000 tonne of copper cathode per annum, uh, and we're currently doing 10,000 tonnes. So, there is a lot of room for us to, to grow, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to feed the beast, continue putting more feed through that plant. Um, the other thing just to touch on, all those pits are on existing mining leases. So it's a very quick segue to, to getting mining. Now, you know, there's the way things are shaping, we could be mining as early as Q3 this year. All the deposits we've got actually are on uh, existing mining leases. Uh, and it makes a really compelling risk versus return uh, exploration opportunity. Uh, resource extensions and near mine life extensions have been identified and we intend to drill them out this year. Our goal in the next 18 months is to become both an oxide and a sulfide producer. Our goal, 3000 ton per month. So three times what we're doing. This will make Austral a very significant business. Growth strategy. You know, I've heard, I've heard, sat in a lot of the presentations today where everyone's talking about Tiger Country and, uh, and so on. Well, we're sitting up in that base metals hub as well. Uh, and certainly if you look in and around us, where there are a lot of very big copper producers. You've got Mount, Mount Isa Mines, Ernest Henry, Dougal River, Cannington, Lady Loretta's on our boundary. Uh, and many others that, you know, that have actually presented uh, here today are in and around that area as well. We have over 120 prospects. Our team's currently focused on whittling that down and, and we're just focusing on those within a 25 kilometre radius of our processing facility. Over the coming slides, I'll explain what we believe are the most economic opportunities for us to really hit hard for the rest of this year. The image on this slide is all Austral's tenure. Uh, and you can see the, the three belts of that northwest, northwest Queensland mineral province. So our immediate focus is extend our oxide mine life. Secondly, bring Lady Colleen online. And thirdly, with these, uh, with these pits I was just touching on, that's to increase that uh, annual revenue and processing ability. Again, by, by us putting more feed through that plant, 
you know, that's going to pull that C1 cost down even further. And the fact that the cutbacks would potentially be done in existing pits, there's a lot less waste there, uh, a lot more viably economical. Uh, our team has been drilling uh, Antil. So this is a slide on Antil 2.0. So the drilling we did last year really kind of gave the team uh, a real gauge on where they should be heading next. They've designed a strong continuous trend of copper anomalies and forming an envelope showing the potential to host economic mineralization as shown on the slide here. Legacy drilling has also shown that over 30% of our mining lease on this one has not been touched at all. There's been no samples taken. There's been no drilling done. So we intend to, uh, to really close that out for the rest of this year. Lady Colleen, so I touched on Lady Colleen. That was a real success story for us in 2022. Uh, we put some more drill rigs down. We knew it was there. We put some more drill rigs in and it turned this real possibility from a possibles and probables into a run on come game day. So that's something that we're really focusing on for, for trying to pull online for next year. Again, existing mining lease, uh, it's within three kilometers of the processing hub, um, albeit we'll, we'll be tolling that out, but nonetheless, transport, everything else right there. The scoping study used on, on uh, Lady Colleen uh, had a discounted copper price of $12,000 a tonne. That's leaving us around $90 million free cash flow. Use today's copper prices at 13,500. That's going to add a further $45 million to the bottom line for the project. So putting us up somewhere around uh, $130 million. Uh, I'll touch on some of the, I'm mindful of time here, so I don't want to run, run myself out of time. I am not a technical guy, I'm not a geo, so I certainly won't uh, try and baffle you with the, the, those terms. Uh, but in short, you know, feel free to reach out to our team. Ben Coots, our exploration manager, can, uh, can bend your ear off on this, but some, certainly some really nice high-grade intercepts there. Uh, you can see 2.22% copper at 31 metres. Uh, everything's sort of sitting there in the red and purples, the, the money. Austral's aim to convert. This is our part of our further exploration team. So I mentioned there we've got 120 targets. Uh, we're whittling that down. We're focusing this year on 10 oxide opportunities and three sulfides. The lower left-hand image here is Lady Annie, an existing pit. Um, and that's looking through that resource model, showing high-grade copper sulfide sitting there. Again, existing mining lease. We still have those mining leases. This is another one of our targets in, in 2023. The exploration potential in Austral's tenure is massive. The opportunity currently is undervalued and underappreciated. Certainly makes us a very cheap proposition. JV's uh, joint ventures. So we've recently entered into a, a joint venture with Glencore. Uh, and that's a superb opportunity to really potentially unlock one of the next major sulfide discoveries up in that area. Austral and MIM, um, both teams are kind of working concurrently. Uh, Austral, Austral will start a drilling campaign later this year, and Glencore have committed to 15 diamond drill holes uh, for the year as well. Outside of Glencore, we're, we're also in talks with um, three other parties on, on potential joint ventures. One of the things that we're not wanting to do, though, is give away our farm. So uh, we're very mindful of that. Investment highlights with two minutes to go. We are a producing... We are a producing copper mine. Again, I've carted this sheet of copper here just to show that we produce copper cathode, not concentrate. We're doing a thousand ton a month and we've been doing that since December. Our quarterly will be out next week, uh, really showing how, how strong we have performed uh, so far this year. And again, in challenging circumstances with the wet weather. We have a substantial mineral resource, over 400,000 ton of contained copper. We have a lot of infrastructure, over $400 million, fully operational. And our goal is to continue feeding that and increasing that revenue stream. We are also a pure copper play. That is what we're focused on. We are in the right country. We have huge tenure. In that area, there, there's over 262,000 tonnes of copper produced per year. Our goal is to become one of Australia's best performing copper companies. Ticker AR1, load up. That's it.
minute to spare. John, that was absolutely brilliant. Well done. You certainly kept us all awake and on our toes with that one. And you nailed it with 33 seconds to go. Congratulations to you. Ionic, come on up here, sir, and join us on stage. They've got a long life resource in Uganda. It's a rare earth long life resource. It's an adsorption clay hosted deposit. Yes, it's very simple to separate the ionic bonds when it's found that way. The life of the mine is projected to be over three decades, correct? Yeah, you've got a low capex, it's scalable with an expiration upside, and you are targeting production in 2024. And the person to whom I am addressing my unanswered questions to, who's very focused on his program, is Rare Earth's chairman, Trevor Benson. He's here to share the story of Ionic with you. If you'd please make him very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. And um, thank you all for turning out. What a great um, turnout for the last couple of shifts. So Ionic Rare Earths. I just want you to remember, remember a couple of things while I go through the presentation. And that is that we are producing, will be pr producing sustainable sourcing of rare earths. And we are predominantly magnet and heavy rare earths. And we are predominantly looking at the Western demand. Oh, what am I doing here? So. So I just want to point out a couple of pillars of our organization. So Ionic Rare Earth Vision. We are a mining company of rare earths. We're in development stage. Uh, we have a project in Uganda, in Africa. Uh, it's under a mining license application. We hope that the mining license will be granted in the next couple of months, fingers crossed. Um, it's a long life uh, ionic absorption clay and it's scalable and there's huge exploration potential. The other thing that you'll note is we want to be a full life cycle uh, rare earth uh, producer and we want to look at the uh, downstream in refining of rare earths and we, we are looking at uh, a number of markets where we will joint venture potentially the rare earth separation plant um, either in the US or in Europe. So we are looking at all those uh, loca those locations seriously. Um, and we have in, in one case, a scoping study underway for a rare earth separation plant. The other thing we do uh, a little bit off center, but we're in the recycling. We have um, a recycling of magnets business uh, based in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And that's because uh, a year ago, we bought the um, technology from Queen's University in Belfast. I'll talk about that a bit later on. So a snapshot of the company. The main takeaways there are we've got uh, cash to keep going. Uh, we've got a good management team, Tim Harrison, our MDs, chemical engineer, metallurgist, um, who's driving this, this process. And uh, with the share price um, has really tracked the underlying commodities, being the rare earth prices and the basket of rare earth prices. So it's getting very close to the, the greatest buy of all time. In, the, in terms of rare earths and, and stocks exposed to rare earths. So this is a, a summary of the, of the issues that uh, are ahead of us in terms of the red shows that China dominates the entire uh, chain, supply chain from mining, processing, to, through to metals, magnets, and, and even recycling. And there is obviously a trend that the Western world 
is diversifying their supply lines uh, and will throw incredibly huge amounts of money, as we've all read, at, at the pro solving the problem. So we can't get away from the fact that there are ge geopolitical forces uh, that are prevalent today. And, and we've seen news in the US that they're going to throw $380 billion at what they have classified as critical minerals and in securing sustainable, traceable supply of, of critical minerals, and rare earths is one of them. Recently, you would have also read that Europe has just produced the European Critical Raw Material Act, and that's really put a, um, a fired up the, the EU in also following suit to make sure they have sufficient critical minerals in their supply chain and gone further to suggest that they want certain percentages diversified sources diversified around the globe. We want to be part of this solution. So we are going to be uh, a producer of rare earths from Uganda. We're going to be in the refining once we decide on a joint venture and, and a partner, and we will be in the recycling of rare earth oxides from spent magnets. So, so we have a circular economy and we want to be capable of being an alternative supplier, supplier to the Western um, industries. So when we look at Makutu, the name of our Ugandan rare earth deposit, it, it is enormous. It's 37 kilometers long. It's 500 million tons. Uh, it's simple mining. It's three meters under the surface down to 30 meters. And it's held in an ionic clay. So that's our that's our pillar that's our main focus then we are looking at the the refining and going downstream and we want to be in part of the chain of of being able to supply um, separate rare earth molecules into downstream industries and into alloy metals and magnet manufacturers we we have pretty much known uh, globally now for our value of our basket. And we talk about basket in what rare earth composition uh, our, our product has. And, and as I said before, we are very heavily into the magnet and heavy rare earths. About 71% of our in entire product is, is, for heavy, is heavy rare earths and magnets. And we have a sustainable model of not only um, ESG driven company, but recycling company and the ability to recycle old magnets and produce oxides. So the most recent news is we've just completed our stage one definitive feasibility study. The main takeaways from that study, extensive study, is the stage one, which covers the central license, is 35 years mine life. Uh, it has only $120 million of capital expenditure to get it into production. So very low, low cost production. We have no radionuclides, so we don't need cracking plants. Um, we can produce, we produce a mineral a, a mixed rare earth carbonate, and we ship that to separation plant. So we understand from being um, be, be, um, talking to governments and to end users that this product is highly sought after because 
the the world is short of heavy rare earths and that's where the real value lies in our basket so we really want to be in the in the entire value chain but you can see from that slide that um that we have this massive deposit in Makutu in Uganda and I'll talk a little bit about Uganda because it's not widely known as a jurisdiction mining jurisdiction um we we because it's an ionic absorption clay it's a very simple operation heap leach operation uh and it's really an earth moving exercise and if you know anything about rare earths it's all about um the the dealing with the clays and and the recovery of the rare earths and in in Uganda we are very fortunate to have infrastructure that is is pretty compelling in terms of the hydroelectric power that we have um five cents per kilowatt hour we have um, highway road access a lot of water um, we're in the south of, of Uganda and the road is through to Kenya and we'll ship out through Mombasa and and we also have uh you know a great story in terms of the exploration potential beyond the central license and the 35 year mine life that we have there so a little bit about Uganda because it's not widely known about um Total's Lake Albert project is probably the biggest um project in in Uganda and the pipeline um as you can see from that uh, map uh the orange is our project we're um about an hour east of ginger ginger is where we have an office with 50 people and it is also the source of the nile on on lake victoria so we we fly into entebbe and there's a toll, very good toll road through through the um bottom of the country so so um very stable good um good uh um po politically it's very stable and very investment investment friendly they've just upgraded their mining act and like all African countries and we're working with the government at the moment to uh, we've submitted our mining license application and we hope to have that as I said in the next couple of months So this is a massive resource. This is 500 million tons. Um, and you can see there that the, the phase, the stage one definitive feasibility study is just over the red hatched area. Um, and that's where our mining license, that's the mining license uh, area. And you can see that we have within that, within that tenement, we have 259 million tons uh, and as you'll know from uh, um, ionic clays, all the weathering has been done, and so the the processing is is easy. It's the recoveries that that is and and the chemical process. Basically, um, you are adding ammonium sulfate, and we are um, dropping the clays out of through heap leach operation. So uh, the rare earths out through the heap leach operation. So there's a lot of um that's 37 kilometers long in total the entire um area and we're only looking at the small area of red in the middle so in terms of ESG which uh really is the, the underlying factors within our company um we have a great environmental story We've got our environmental uh, certificate from the Ugandan government, but we have a we have a great story um, in that basically the process is 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 producing fertilizer, and we're fertilizing the soil we've taken out and and putting it back, and proving it to be a a great um, in, um, increase in the in the quality of the soil. So it, it's a great um, rehabilitation story. Um, in terms of social, we have um, 
enormous uh, engagement from the local communities. We work in the local community within the kingdom and within obviously the government of Uganda and right down to the um, stakeholders on the ground. Um, we've had up to 3,800 people turn up to various meetings and and they were very supportive of the of this operation. Today we have to be recorded in terms of ESG performance, and many of you know of Digby, who are um, uh, rated by the World Bank, so and the and and IFC. So they give us a, a rating and tell us how we can get to AAA. Lastly. We have in Northern Ireland, a magnet recycling business. We basically, we take the spent magnets. Uh, we have about 40 tons of them at the moment, and we're currently uh, commissioning the plant and we will be producing oxides, hopefully in June, July this year. So it's an interesting dynamic. We're getting a lot of um, traction. Uh, it's through this process, um, which we, we bought the technology from Queen's University in, in Belfast. We're getting a lot of traction and obviously we produce um, individual um, oxides and it can go back into new permanent magnets, but it actually gets us into the supply chain. So there's our facility in Belfast. It's being commissioned upscaled at the moment. And as I said, um, we'll be hopefully producing oxides in the middle of the year, but it does get us early into this supply chain and, talk, and speaking to end users. So the value proposition with ionic rare earths is, is rare earth prices have actually halved in the last year. Um, they must be getting very close to the bottom. So um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to invest into into the into rare earths and obviously leverage through ionic so we've got a huge uh, resource we've got a long long mine life um and we've got the recycle we've got the we're looking at the re the separation plant and we're looking at the recycling and lastly one of these slides from uh very large global investment banks um sees us at the bottom where they call it the valley of death that's probably where we are, we are, but once we get into production, I think you'll see us um, outperform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor Benson. There we go. That is our second last presentation for today as far as our presenters go. We're going to keep with our theme. Our final company presentation for Singapore 23 is keeping with that theme. We've chosen to round out the conference, and that is Rare Earths, Northern Minerals. Come on up here and join us, sir. They have a vision to become a leading producer of ethically produced rare earths, and uh, especially the heavy rare ones. And just to test me at the end of the day, you've popped in there uh, dysprosium and terbium. Similar? Very good. Great. It's your turn to say all the other ones in your presentation. This is our penultimate presentation. And to do the honours, would you please make welcome Northern Minerals MD, Nicholas Curtis AM. Welcome, Nick. sir. F fancy getting the graveyard ship. I will keep this to the point and uh, fairly rapid. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to present again. The rare earth industry is indeed a diversified and intriguing one. And I'm very happy to be back in the rare, and rare earth industry where I've been involved now for 20 odd years in some capacity or another. There is a reason why um, I've chosen to come back into the rare earth industry in Northern Minerals. It's because I think this is one of the most fascinating opportunities in the sector at the moment. Uh, and I think this company, we've kept a fairly sharp eye on keeping simple the story and keeping ourselves pointing heavily towards our future production. Let me give you quickly some of the executive highlights, or if you like the investment highlights. Boom. Let's see, this is working. Yep. Right. The green. Green arrow. Got it. Disposers. We've got all those. Before I do, I just want to actually acknowledge the Jaru people of the country on which we will build this operation. It is really a critical element of everybody's involvement in the mining industry. 
that we do work with local community in a very close and meaningful way. And we're very happy to have a very strong relationship. And I didn't want to let the opportunity pass without mentioning Jaru People's uh, in partnership with us. The highlight points. Essentially, we want to be, in the near term, the leading non-China supplier of this metal that nobody's really ever heard of called dysprosium, shortened to DY, much easier, uh, and terbium, which are very, very important in the future of the magnet industry. Magnets are vital. And essentially, battery technology stores energy. Magnet converts that en energy into kinetic energy and allows the propulsion systems to work. And they're just as important, if not in many ways more critical than the storage elements of it. I think the market is now focusing, people are now focusing on these elements. Uh, and so we want to be the leading supplier. When I say leading supplier, it's a small market. I'll come back to it. It's about 2,000 tonne a year. We are going to be producing about 400 to 500 tonnes a year of dysprosium, so a significant part of the market. Um, we've de-risked this project substantially in a very important partnership that we have with, uh, with Iluca Minerals. Iluca is building a $1.5 billion uh, rare earth separation plant at Eniaba in Western Australia. It's the second plant uh, outside of China of that size, one I know very well called Linus, uh, which I was very heavily involved with early on. And this is the second non-China substantial uh, rare earth separation plant. Um, second time around, um, we've simplified this and uh, decided that the best thing that, that Northern Minerals could do is stay being a miner and not go down into the chemical end of the industry. Been there, done that. It is very, very complicated. Uh, and we're very happy that we're able to produce a concentrate at Brown's range and then go and sell that directly to the front gate of Iluca. Uh, and I'll explain the terms on which we get that. We think we're very happy with those as well. Uh, the mine has been well established uh, at, for a long time, not as an operating mine uh, at scale, but as a pilot plant. We've had a pilot plant there for three years, and that gives us a very large element of de-risking the production process uh, on, on the way through. The flow sheet is well developed uh, and really it's a matter of getting this thing into production. It is in a region, district, province, whatever you want to call it, um, that is very exciting for potential further rare earth discovery. We, it has been drilled out. There's been over 150,000 metres of drilling over 10 years at, uh, at Brown's Range uh, and it's shown very significant occurrences of mineralisation uh, that are for the future in, in a big way. But our key primary focus today as a company is get the mine built and start getting into the system with cash flow and uh, an operating entity. That has been the focus well, that has been the focus of our strategic review since I took uh, the chairmanship of the company about 18 months ago uh, and we are now effectively ready to move into that. Uh, the company was founded as a uranium exploration company. Instead of finding uranium, as often happens, it found rare earths, which are associated, uh, and has been for 10 years developing that rare earths uh, deposit and system. We'll come back to where we are. This is an illustration of the pilot plant that was running up there. This is not the production unit we will have, but it has produced well over 1,000 tonnes of rare earth concentrate over three years and therefore does give us a very high level of confidence in terms of the ability to process this material and produce a commercial product for sale. The proposition is that in this high quality mineral field that I've talked about, we have found the starter mine. We will build the Browns Range plant we believe that the Wolverine mine, as we've called it, which is a open pit underground uh, development, which we will be doing uh, starting next year, is the first of potentially many in the region. The mineralization structures on this granite dome uh, are well understood, uh, and we have de-emphasized further exploration work for the purposes of de dedicating our funding towards early development, but we will go back to this rich geological system uh, which is quite unique as an underground expression or a deep expression, primary expression, if you want to put it that way, of the dysprosium and terbium mineral called xenotime, which usually is better known for its occurrence in ionic clays. 
but obviously it's a much higher grade material when you get it in deep primary form. Um, we think, as far as we know, this is the only hard rock mine uh, that we know of, which is economically heavily exposed to dysprosium and terbium over and above any other element. So it's a pure play, not in rare earths, but in a very specific rare earths element. That is because the distribution of xenotime is rich in dysprosium and terbium. Um, we have about 10% effectively terbium and uh, dysprosium. They go together. Um, I'll come back to the application. I think Trevor talked a little bit about the applications of these heavy rare earths and the supply chain. Um, but uh, that is 80 or 75% of our economic value. The other rare earths are interesting, some of them not payable, but you'll note that, for example, in NDPR, neodymium presidimium, which drive Linus, which drive all the larger uh, rare earth operations because of their use in the magnet market, we're actually quite light. We're only 3.2% 3, 3 of neodymium. Um, so this is really about a very specialty metal. We're moving towards production. Um, we have uh, an operation, have had an operation up there with 50 or 60 people during the pilot plant. We've mothballed that for now. And we move, we're doing a DFS uh, based on some earlier DFS work that was done in 2015. We expect the DFS to be complete in October. Um, and then we are looking for uh, FID in early 2024, first Q1 2024. Production is forecast to align with the opening of the Iluka plant in 2026, uh, where we will be feeding about 20% of Iluka's throughput capacity will come from this mine. The supply agreement with Iluka is strategically valuable to us because it actually takes away both CapEx obligation to our shareholders with its very dilutive effect and uh, price uh, and marketing risk uh, on the way through. Um, the agreement is one which allows both parties to benefit. Iluka obviously need to get some benefit of the oxide price that we don't get in order to get back some of the one, a return on the one and a half billion dollars they're spending building that part of the plant. Uh, we, on the other hand, don't have to spend the money on that. We also simplify massively our operational requirements uh, and that is valuable for us as, uh, on, on the way through as well. I'll come back to the, the uh, Iluka transaction because it's uh, a very important part of the value in this company and the creation of value in this company. The processing plant is simple. The pilot plant did try and produce, what well, did produce carbonate uh, up at Browns Range, which is up in the Kimberleys and a long way from anywhere. Um, we've simplified that and said, we're gonna cut the carbonate out. And that's why we're selling the concentrate directly to Aluka. So it really comes down to a known and fairly, fairly straightforward process of run of mine ore, crushing, mag set, float, concentration uh, through that float, uh, float producing about 25% cons uh, and we'll be feeding about uh, 20,000 tons a year to the Iluka plant of that 25% cons, taking it by road from the Kimberleys down to any ABBA. Um, it's a high value product. The actual road transportation is not a particular barrier to anything. We um, have existing non-process infrastructure ranging from airstrips to camps up there. Um, and we're gonna leverage off that to get going quickly. The demand for terbium and dysprosium is really linked entirely to the evolution of use of high intensity magnets for the EV market and things like the uh, offshore wind turbine or the wind turbine magnet uh, market generally. Permanent magnets have been around a long time. Room temperature permanent magnet activity is fine. You can actually find lots of uses that use permanent magnets at around about room temperature. The problem statement is simply that if you are using permanent magnets, near the mine boron permanent magnets in a high temperature environment, that is anything over about 50 to 60 degrees C, which is the usual operating environment for uh, a electric vehicle or a wind turbine, uh, it, the material will demagnetize and lose its use uh, unless it is blended with about 5% of dysprosium. 
or terbium. It's, I don't use 5% very generically. It depends on the particular magnet, what the particular blend would be. It is, in some senses, the unknown secret source of the magnet industry. Um, and it's that gap in production of dysprosium that actually stops there being a really valid independent supply chain for magnets outside of China. The and presidimium exist. Uh, terbium and dysprosium do not exist in production capacity sufficiently to blend the amount of uh, neodymium presidimium in the proportion required to make permanent magnets. So this is essential. I just want to say that one of the things that is important about the Iluca plant is that with our material, the other side of that plant will come out oxides that are the only place outside of China where you will be able to get access to the proportionate blend of these heavy rare earths and light rare earths to be able to make high intensity magnets for these applications. So we think that's got a very important uh, strategic uh, positioning. China, as we know, is responsible for 90% um, and uh, a lot of the DYTB is coming from Myanmar. Two minutes and we're all over. The Aluka Strategic Partnership, quickly, it is not just a supply agreement. They have, quote them, wanted to make us bankable. They've given us a fixed price contract, which is adequate for us to be able to operate and upside associated with the oxide price. I won't go into the detail. They've also put $20 million in the company through convertible note and equity placement to help us get to FID. And they have committed to taking $50 million of equity at FID. It'll be in total about a $400 million project, 250 million we expect the debt, 50 million equity from Iluca. It makes it a very bankable proposition. It benefits both parties, as I've discussed, we're a big part of their plant um, and, and their planning. And uh, we have a great respect for their technical ability to build that operation. Uh, and uh, are very pleased to be in close partnership with them on the Ever, any ever refinery. This just illustrates the fact that we do get exposure above a certain price to the oxide prices. So our shareholders are not losing the upside of the scarcity in dysprosium. We think there will be a bigger deficit in dysprosium and terbium in, in 2000 and call it 35 or 30, depending on the numbers, than just about any other of the battery minerals, magnets, EV space minerals. Uh, numbers are sort of 2000 production tons of production now. We expect demand to move towards five to 6,000 tons by then per annum, uh, and it's very difficult to see the sources. So really, that's the proposition for the company. It's a very boutique, fairly simple uh, story to understand. We're moving, uh, uh, we're going to produce a very unique product into a structural deficit, uh, which is essential to be plugged in order to get the electrification process underway. We're excited to be involved in it. We've got a good management team doing that. Uh, and uh, we look forward to production 2026. Thank you. Nick, thank you very much. You're much better behaved than Trevor Benson. He took two minutes off me, so you did absolutely brilliantly. And for that, I'll let you stay on this stage and be part of the last panel. Would you like that as a reward? Okay, you can speak more. So I've got my team of minions coming up here with the chairs for our last panel session of the day. We are continuing our focus on rare earths. Feel free to jump up and down for a moment if you seat if you need to and move around rapidly and get yourself a little bit of oxygen back to your brains. Now I'm looking for some more victims for my panel. So let me call you up one by one. Nick is, otherwise Nick, you can be chair and you can chat with yourself for a little while. Okay, so I would like a moderator, please. And I'd like that moderator to take the form of one, George Ross from Argonaut. George Ross, there he is, hand up in the air. Okay, take a microphone, Sarah, as you go past me, point it to the top, and remember to keep it to your mouth as you go. I need Gavin Lockyer from Arafura Resources. Here he comes. And I would like Thomas Krumer from the Rare Earth Observer Place. Thomas, are you in the room? You are, Thomas? You sure? Just your hand didn't go up very far, Thomas, so I'm not 100% sure if that's right or not. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've got Nicholas, and we need Dudley Kingsworth from Australian Rare Earths. Have I got everyone? One, two, three. Dudley, there you are. 
Hello, are you enjoying a glass of wine or is that gin? What have you got at this end of the day? It's water, would you like me to hold that for you, sir? There you go. And you know what, having the seat closest to my desk, you can put your water there. And if you want it in the next 30 minutes, you may have it. So rules of engagement as you are in charge, what do you think they might be for the last session? What would you like? What would your dream rules of engagement be for this session? Well, hopefully we'll keep it short and exciting. I think uh, <laughs> everyone's getting a, a little bit uh, overdrawn after two days of equity. But you're going to be riveting. Uh, oh, well, it, well it's, it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be exciting. I right, so. good. George Ross, riveting research analyst from Argonaut Limited, is going to lead us through Rare Earth's diversifying supply with his team. You can introduce them any way you want, and I'll give you a five-minute bell. Welcome. Would you put your hands together for our last panel, everyone? Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, panel, for all being here. Um, I guess maybe Dudley uh, might start with you. You're, you've been uh, around this space a, a fairly long time. Um, what do you think, uh, I guess, how does technology really impact demand for errors in general? Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much for staying back and, and listening to us. Technology plays a very big part in the rare earth sector, and it's probably led to the biggest changes in the rare earth sector. When I first, I managed Mount World between 1990 and 2000. When I joined Ashton Mining, who owned it then, um, we could have developed the project on the basis of sales of cerium, for the use of glass and, and catalytic converters. The um, rare earth magnets were invented in the 1990s, and that's where we are today. A few years ago, um, the rare earths, heavy rare earths, which we used in the production of phosphors, constituted about 6 to 8% of the market by volume, and about 25 to 30% by value. We invented, somebody invented the LED, and the use of rare earths in lighting went down to less than 10% of that required in the fluorescent lights. As a consequence, the price of yttrium fell from $40 to $50 a kilo to $4 to $5 a kilo. Now, what that says is you've got to be very careful to follow the technologies because if by the time you start your project up, the demand for your products has, has disappeared, you don't have a project. Now, two weeks ago, I was in London and I spoke to uh, the leading magnet producers over there. And I said, well, what are the prospects for new for replacements for rare earths? And they said, well, Dudley, there's a lot of work going into finding alternatives. And there's ways in which we're perhaps introducing serum into some of these magnets to reduce the price. But it's unlikely that we're going to find any substitute for neodymium, iron, boron, dysprosium, and terbium within the next 15 to 20 years. So those of us who are looking on a project which is dependent upon the magnet rare earths, we're OK. Finally, I would just like to say in terms of technology, there have only been four minerals that have been processed for rare earth successfully to date. For those projects that are relying on a new mineral, there's obviously a processing risk. And for those people who are looking at investing in it, just recognize that leads to an, an extended processing develop period, development period and, and, and startup. In addition, Within the rare earth sector as a whole, the separation of the rare earths is critical in terms of rare earth oxides. China has a surplus of capacity, but it makes it very difficult for us to challenge that. There are a lot of processes out there that are looking to substitute conventional solvent extraction. I would suggest that given the time that we have to develop alternative supply chains to China, that we're probably going to have to forgive, for, well, not exactly forget, but delay the use of those new processes because that could well delay bringing those projects on stream. It's better for us to adopt solvent extraction, which is well established, might be a little bit more expensive, but we've got a better idea of how long it takes to bring it on stream. So technology pervades throughout the rare earth sector and you, you, you ignore it at your peril. Thanks. Um, we'd like to take a an interesting one, perhaps the operating space. Um, I guess I think it'd be nice to address 
how difficult is it to find, say, uh, process engineers, chemical engineers with the, uh, I guess, technological experience required to actually process out these rare earth oxides, separate them, um, and who's taking the, the lead uh, globally in developing uh, downstream battery supply chains outside of China? I mean, well, I'm sure everyone's got a view on the availability of people at the moment. It's, uh, Gavin, I'm sure you have particularly. It's uh, complicated, clearly, um, but it depends what stage in the breakdown in the supply chain uh, to for rare earths you are looking for. Obviously, mining are fungible skills. Concentration is a fungible skill. Getting into cracking, you start getting more specific, but again, reasonably fungible across with different industries. Uh, SX e e solvent extraction, that's more specific to rare earths. So I think you, you have to sort of break that into its, its buckets. Is it possible? Well, yes, is the answer. I mean, capability will learn quickly anyway. Uh, people that have a good base will be able to pick up this technology. It's not that extraordinary that you can't learn it. But um, there are plenty of people out there with enough experience to guide and help. So I, I think whilst it is a general barrier to entry for the mining industry at, at the moment as a whole, given the scarcity of people uh, and training in that sector, um, it's not unique to the rare earth industry. And I think the rare earth industry is no less, uh, no more disadvantaged than another uh, in, that, in that talent uh, quest, if you like. So, um, in terms of the second part of the question. Yeah, well, I, I, miss, I mean, I guess uh, outside of China, um, who's taking the lead in doing actual battery production, battery manufacturing? Battery manufacturing. Yeah, like, oh, sorry, sorry, magnet right. manufacturing. Sorry, I've um, been talking lithium all week. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> but actually, you know what? That is exactly what happens. Yeah. People second rate the rear earth because they primary rate battery, and I'm nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but actually, you can't have one without the other. No, 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 absolutely. Um, and uh, so the, the the rare earth supply chain and magnet supply chain is quite critical to understand. Quick answer to your question is very hard to understand. Um, clearly, uh, China is the dominant player in the magnet industry as a whole. I think it's about 94, 95% production of neodymium ion boron rare earths are in China, both for historical reasons and maybe because of supply reasons of materials like, like, um, like rare earth. But it just, if that is the case, then most of the atoms of, uh, of rare earths that are mined in the world end up in China in the Chinese supply chain for magnets. Um, who is going to crack that and change it? Um, well, in the bonded magnet space, you've obviously got NEO who've done a very good job of having a very viable and strong business uh, model uh, outside of China and in China. Uh, in the in in the China, um, sorry, in the non-China uh, sintered magnet space, it's scarce. And I think there's an opportunity for development uh, there uh, to build an integrated supply chain uh, outside of China on sintered magnets uh, separately to the Chinese system. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, look, the Koreans, South Koreans are putting a lot of effort into this, uh, into R&D, um, and some, uh, some groups are actually starting to build magnet plants now, not necessarily in Korea, but uh, in Vietnam and places like that. Um, and certainly our offtake partner, which is Hyundai, is, um, is co-funding a, a plant for, for construction, but as Nick alluded to, it's sintered magnets. Um, you know, the, the IP has been um, developed over many years by um, Hitachi, who basically uh, defended their um, their IP as, as long as they possibly could. Uh, it now pretty much all sits in China. Um, I know the US have some uh, making big strides in terms of trying to expand the um, magnet capacity of um, vacuum schmelz in Germany to transfer some of that um, uh, that technology into the states, but uh, it's at infant stages. Getting some pretty expressive looks <laughs> next year. Anything to expand? Um, yes. Um, so my name is Thomas Krimmer. I run a uh, newsletter about rare earths. Aside from being an active investor, um, last week I held a presentation in Hong Kong to what I would call rare earth virgins. Um, you see, if, if you look at the, uh, say, graphs and statistics from Bloomberg or the International Energy Agency with the investment demand, 
Rare earths practically do not appear. It's like a little sliver somewhere on the bar chart, you know, um, looking totally irrelevant. So what I did was I picked only one application of rare earths and worked the way from the finished application down to the rare earths products. So I took white goods, I took electric vehicles, industrial re robotics, and defense. What they have in common is the so-called um, permanent magnet electric motor. All of them have. You know, some rare earth miners, they will stand here and present to you that an F-35 fighter jet has 400 kilos of rare earths inside. So in front of your mind, there appears this worker in his overall and his helmet with a little shovel with a bluish powder that he puts into the F-35 airplane. That is, of course, complete nonsense. And F-35 contains a, probably about 100 different permanent magnet electric motors. So um, electric vehicles, no, well, even a regular standard combustion engine vehicle will contain 25 of them. Um, if you go into white goods, your washing machine, your dishwasher, your hot water shower pump, nothing will work without these motors. 65% of these motors are rare earth permanent magnet electric motors, and that is where rare earths come in. They have such a large market share because the motors become smaller and smaller, and the magnets inside must become stronger and stronger. And that is where the much talked about NDFEB magnet comes in. So if we boil all of that down, you will see that the $10 billion a year rare earth industry feeds downstream industries to the tune of $3.2 trillion. And that is only in one application. If you wipe that all out, there was a presentation of Neo Performance Materials some years ago, $11 trillion. So the leverage is enormous, but the elements simply don't register. If you take the bill of materials for an electric vehicle, only the non-ferrous metals, rare earths will register with less than 0.8%. So nobody really notices, but without it, nothing works. Yeah. Sure. And Dudley, I guess with... As far as um, Elon Musk's recent claims of, you know, substituting out rare earths uh, out of EVs, uh, I, I remember sort of 10 years ago when we had the last rare earth run, there was a lot of talk about engineering out rare earths um, and it hasn't happened. Um, do you think it's a real threat to the rare earth industry? Do you think it's possible? Um, is it practical? Um I don't, I mean, Elon Musk in, in, in his statement, he, he said he's going to eliminate rare earth permanent magnets, but he did say out of the dry. Now, the people listening to the presentation thought he meant out of all applications within electric vehicles. That's incorrect. Now, you've got to look at a bit of history. When he first invented the, te the Tesla, he said no rare earth permanent magnets, and he realized it didn't work too well with induction motors, so then he put rare earth permanent magnets in. Recently, he's had a rare earth permanent drive in the front. An induction motor in the back. So, yeah, he's reducing that. Now, there was another thing that was said during during his presentation. He said, look, they're moving forward. He said, by the end of, by 2030, there's going to be one robot on this planet for every person. Now, most of those robots are going to require reverse terminal magnets in, in those actuators, because you can imagine, I mean, they're not, they're not, not all going to be women that, that be robotic women that, that replace their wives or housekeepers. These are, but particularly in those where the fingers have to move very precisely, they're going to need a powerful, powerful actuator. And the only way that can be achieved is with a rare earth permanent magnet. So I looked upon it as a positive statement by Elon Musk. There's going to be increasing demand for rare earth permanent magnets or robots. I would just add, that we talk about the magnets, but also for Australia in particular, to be competitive, we have to be competitive in getting as far as a rare earth oxide. It's very good to see that we now have a Labour government that is committed to funding the rare earth industry. 
32 years ago, I, I went to Anstow and I was working for, for Mount Weld and we wanted to build a pilot block. And um, what we wanted was to actually get them to build the building in which it was going to be placed. And then we'd put the, the pilot plant inside. And I went there and there was Mr. Peter Cook, who was a minister for industry, science and technology. Um, and in those days, the chief scientist was head of Anstow, not a CEO. And we put forward the case that Anstow would build the laboratory, the building, and we would put our uh, rare earth pilot plant in there. Peter Cook stood there and said, yes, we're going to do it. Now, Anstow is now a leading uh, laboratory that carries out a lot of research into processing of, of rare earths. And that was because that was a commitment by the Labour Labour government at that stage. The cost of the building was a whole lot more the initial investment of our pilot plant. And when we'd finished using it initially, what we did, the board of Ashton wanted to sell it. And I said, no, we shouldn't. We transferred it to uh, Anstow for a nominal amount of money on the basis that that would, could be used by other companies to test their rare earth ore. So we've got to think about the front end as well as the back. And um, I'm very pleased to see that We've got a Labour government here in, in Australia that's actually looking at investing in that research and, and technology to make sure that we at least have a good chance of, against competing about them against the major user. Thanks, Stephen. Okay. Can I yep. just add something to the Tesla comments? Because it's I'm sure Nick's had plenty of the questions as well. We were at a, uh, Nick and I were at a UBS um, Investor Day last week in Sydney. And uh, this, this question came up quite a lot. Um, now, anecdotally, if um, and to take nothing away from Tesla, because it's an extremely innovative uh, company, and if anybody's going to do it, uh, they may well be the, the group that can do it, where uh, GM, BMW, Toyota haven't been able to. So I'll take nothing away from Tesla and their uh, ability to uh, make drastic change in any industry. But a number of the um, funds that I was speaking to at the time, their theory was that uh, apparently uh, Tesla were trying to renegotiate their rare earth magnet um, contracts with their Chinese supplier at the time that uh, Elon made those uh, comments. So take that as uh, what you will. I think, Gavin, if I may, I think, I think you, you, you bring a good point up and that comment echoed around the world uh, of rare earths far more. It wasn't, by the way, Elon Musk who made the comment. It was the uh, head of uh, oh. the, of, of why. Uh, and I thought my reflection on it really would be that it, pro it possibly was a clarion call to the lack of a transparent supply chain, tra sufficiently transparent supply chain uh, outside of China, rather than a statement we will change unless the pricing is right or anything else. I think it actually might have been more about a strategic imperative for a supply chain that is completely independent of the Chinese system from a Tesla point of view, which you'd understand given what's going on in the US at the moment. Yeah, and who champions that supply chain? Does it have to be the OEMs that have to, you know, the, the EV OEMs that have to start really uh, investing at that end? Who champions the supply chain is a function of the market. Um, governments will influence the success of that supply chain, um, but the market must be able to sustain that supply chain from primary production of concentrate through to the price of magnets. There is an argument to say, well, you know, you'll never compete with China. And it's not, I don't know what the pricing structure will be, and some support will be needed uh, to incent people to qualify non-China magnets because the qualification process is long and arduous uh, on, on the way through. Um, but at the end of the day, my own view, and everybody's got a different view, is that you couldn't really rely just on the government to drag you through, albeit things like a loan of $1.25 billion to uh, Iluca to build the Eniaba refinery is a pretty good start. Yeah, and... I, I guess that capital barrier um, is an issue for a lot of people. Uh, do you think that's how, I mean, it, it, 
it doesn't seem very sustainable to me that that's you know government intervention is the only way to to make these things happen um well linus got up with no government money yeah uh, yes, uh, true, Japanese uh, government did put a little bit of money in late in the piece uh, for the Linus development of the second stage of the Linus plant, but it got up from market when market circumstances were such that the demand was intensely there. I think the demand will be and continues to grow into an intensely there situation for the rare earths and the magnet supply chain, meaning prices go up, meaning the incentive of development is there, and meaning that the market is able to actually supply. So that's probably the normal cycle. I'm, don't think anything extraordinary might will happen. Yeah, others will be. Uh, Thomas, maybe. Um, what do you think about incentive pricing? Sort of what's what's the what's what's say NDPR pricing that that is sufficient to um, incentivize development of new projects, but at the same time is is, is going to be palatable by end users. Do you think? Yeah, the biggest problem for rare earth projects, apart from permitting, is that actually we do not have a market for rare earth. What we buy from China is 70% uh, lansanum and cerium, and of the remainder, the value added uh, rare earth products, most of it goes to Japan. So Japan still has a magnet supply chain, which has gone basically completely missing in the rest of the world. I mean, you mentioned vacuum schmelz. So they have a capacity of 1,300 tons per year in Germany. I do not know what they have in Slovakia and in Malaysia. In China, they have the 49% joint venture. The EU imports 20,000 tons of NDFEB magnets per year. Yeah, and that is the capacity we have. There is one project that is Neo Performance Materials, the only ones in the West who really know how to make magnets. And um, they initially said 10,000 ton plant in Estonia of NDFEB magnets, and it was 5,000, now it's 2,000. Um, we simply do not have the downstream market for the value added rare earths. We have for the cheap throwaway byproducts, lansanum and cerium, uh, which cost like a dollar a kilo, which is probably one eighth of the production cost, um, which is because of the inherent balance that you have in rare earth. The, the occurrence, the composition of the occurrence is not equal to the composition of the demand. If you want the value added product, you have to take the other products as well. So that is, these are the main products we are buying. For the others, we really don't have a real market. So if a rare earth miner comes on stream and says, I'm going to do 4,000 tons of NDPR, that is fantastic. First of all, the heavy rare earths are missing, which come from Northern Minerals, hopefully. Yeah. The other thing is they sign off takes with, say, automotive sub suppliers or uh, say industrial water sub suppliers who then hope to convert these oxides that they buy somewhere to magnets. And that is very problematic if you don't want to involve China. And in China, I would see two motivations. China has already built up capacities in these magnets that will cover world demand until 2030. So um, they may take it into full capacity and to retain full control of the magnet business. Yeah. But they may also not, when the Chinese government may say, no, we do not allow the duty-free import of raw materials for this type of conversion. Then we are dead in the water. And then the automotive sub-supplier will cancel with the rare earth company. And what do they do then? So that is a real big problem. Uh, it, uh, it, it, one can always say what was the first, the hen or the egg, but we really lack the downstream production. I, Tom, Thomas, can I sorry, just jump in? I, I think you make a, a very good point. The industry, even to map the industry flows of the material through the various stages is extremely difficult. Uh, and it's very hard to know the volumes. Um, I touched on, we've been having discussions, obviously with the Aluka, operation uh, having a balance of rare earth oxides which would be suitable 
for a downstream magnet supply chain. There have been some fairly strong discussions about how that could be enabled. The key point that I certainly make is qualification must be shortcut or supported. If a government has the ability to actually do anything, it's not financial. It's just ensure that the qualification process is not one that takes five years because you can't build that level of risk into a project and take five years to get a customer on the way through. True, but the US are intense, uh, incentivizing the uh, uh, made in America so strongly, it's irresistible. So once there is a supply base for the oxides, I, from Australia or any other friendly country, I believe that some investment funds will start looking into investing in there. But then we have the problem with the expertise. Where do the experts come from? We don't have any. The, the, the last time we produced uh, uh, separated rare earths in Europe was in 1992, and then La Rochelle went down because they still have 13,800 tons of radioactive waste, 8,400 tons of which are on the uh, factory grounds in La Rochelle. So uh, the, the, I, I believe that in the US, the, the uh, users are extremely motivated. Let's say General Motors. General Motors uh, develop a lot of activity. They signed one contract with vacuum schmelze for a thousand tons, thousand measly tons. US imported 8,000 tons last year. And then we have the um, Bockhorns from um, uh, MP Materials who also want to produce magnets in Fort Worth, Texas, another thousand tons. It will be beautiful because they plan to turn out 6,000 tons of NBPR per year. And Fort Worth will take, if it's running really well, it's 300 tons. What do they do with the rest? You can't ship it to China because there is a trade war duty on US made rare earth oxides of 27.5%. Yeah. I'd just like to add it. I mean, the price is dictated by the cost of producing it. Now, at the moment, the majority of the original equipment manufacturers. When they show you a supply chain, it begins at the metal because they don't like to admit that there's a mine at the front. And if people, if, if the original equipment manufacturers in talking about their supply chain went back and included the mine, then the true cost and the, what's, being, what's being caused by poor practice environmentally would make those companies who don't comply with global environmental standards improve those and that would increase the cost and that would in itself make it much easier for com for countries like Australia to compete in the rare earth supply chain and for our, on our part what we have to do is to go to the original equipment manufacturers the people at the end of the supply chain and say well this is our supply chain this is totally transparent and Nick I will acknowledge that Linus um, when you were there you started these life, whole of life supply chain. And that is something that we, well, yeah, in the rare earth sector, we really have to make it totally transparent in terms of the supply chain. And I believe that that will lead to increased costs for those people who take shortcuts, which will make it easier for the people who comply with all the standards to compete. Can I just add, I think the question originated around, do we need subsidised pricing? And I think um, that's never worked throughout history. I look at the car industry in Australia, it was complete failure. And so I, I agree with everybody on this panel, but uh, I think Nick made a good point when he said that um, people, um, the, people uh, or the, the producers need to identify that they are, sorry, not the producers, the OEMs need to identify that they are an enabler. The governments need to identify that they are an enabler. Don't be a disabler through lengthy processes to qualify or to permit or whatever. I think we're seeing the OEMs, particularly COVID highlighted, the fact that if you don't have a, a piece of uh, componentry for an electric or for any car, uh, that um, is cost costs less than one percent of the of the vehicle. You don't have a have a car. I've got uh, friends that have bought high performance German cars um, and had them delivered in Australia last year. They don't have electric seats. 
because they had no magnets coming out of China through COVID. And this has really opened up the eyes of the industry, I think, where governments global have been trying to work on uh, diversifying supply chain from a government to government level. Um, I think industry now and big industry is now starting to appreciate that and starting to act. Great, thanks. Um, we've got three panelists here with projects in Australia. I, I guess, um, how much of an advantage do you think that's viewed as uh, within, I, I guess, the global investment community? Is that is that something, it, you know, I think Australia is a fantastic place to invest in, but um, yeah. I take responsibility for the decision to put the Linus plant in Malaysia. Um, <laughs> the, Linus, the, the Linus plant has um, demonstrated that the world has changed. When we made that decision, it was a globalization world. Mm. Uh, and in Thomas, uh, Thomas Friedman's famous Lexus and the olive tree analogy, um, we were all playing the Lexus, not the olive tree. The, the pendulum has swung back the other way now to localization for reasons that have nothing to do with rational economics and a lot to do with global political and sociological events. Um, and that's not gonna go away in a hurry. So it is valuable to have uh, a, a more localized uh, operation. It is probably viewed as um, safer for people. Um, does it translate into a very particular um, support for a non, uh, for, for an Australian operation? I don't think so. I think your economics ultimately will decide whether people want to invest in you or not. Um, it's just a less resistance than an asset by which I'll, I'll invest in that because it is in Australia, if that makes sense. Yeah, Thomas. I think um, we, we have to basically decide what we want. Do we contain, want to contain China or do we want carbon neutral? Um, because only one of these will work. Uh, we, we will not have carbon neutral by 2050 if we want to contain China, simply because it's such a fully integrated part of the, the whole supply chain that we need for electric vehicles, for offshore wind turbines, for industrial robots, and you name it. So if we try to do it against China, we will not meet 2050. If we do it with China, there is a chance. Of course, this is politically completely incorrect, and I, I personally find it sickening what is happening in Xinjiang. Um, but the reality is like this. It's a brutal trade-off. Cheers. Gavin, um, Arif, you has been around for a while now. How has, how I, I guess, the business landscape or industry landscape sort of changed compared to um, back when it all began? Uh, good question. Well, when I started with Arafura 17 years ago, I think my first um, international rare earths conference was the second one, and that's where I met Nick for the first time. So a lot of the faces haven't changed, Dudley included. Um, but I think uh, I think there's certainly a, a realization now that it's about the magnets. You know, when we we were all a bit naive, I guess, in the start, where we were trying to sell the basket. Um, we were all going to make oxides, 715 oxides. Um, it, it's certainly now focused on where it needs to be and where it should have always been, to be honest. Um, and so I think that has changed. And I think that um, I now don't have to go to, uh, to an Argonaut uh, desk briefing and explain what a rare earth is. So that's certainly uh, something uh, that's changed in, our, in my lifetime. Yeah, so I would agree with what you, you said that, that Gavin, it's... Um... We've got a much better appreciation now that you can't, you're not just a rare earth carbonate or rare earth oxide producer, you're part of a supply chain. You've got to commit to being part of that supply chain. You've got to work hard to understand each step and recognize that you are part of that supply chain. Hard work, but actually it's, it's well worth it and uh, very rewarding. And I do think in Australia, we're very fortunate with a lot of resources we have. We're very fortunate and we have ANSTO, and a number of laboratories have got expertise in the processing of rare earths. We've got some very good uh, co companies that offer mining expertise. So it's up to us to continue to move forward and, and make the most of it. I just want to call Gavin out for saying, uh, with a thank you for saying that places haven't changed in 17 years. <laughs> I don't believe that for one moment. Um, th 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 thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. The industry has, hasn't changed in some ways. 
has changed, continues to get focused, and I think we've got a very, very exciting future right ahead of us now. We were pretty early 20 years ago. Now is when it's really happening. Fantastic. Um, how much time have we got? Two minutes? Oh, we can wrap it up. Okay, all right. Well, look, um, thanks very much, gentlemen. I think that was a fantastic discussion for, uh, for us to have. And um, I hope the, uh, the crowd has learned a lot. Cheers. Thanks, team. Hold on to your microphones for one second. Before you all leave, I just wanted to say a very big thank you. We on Wednesday, that there was never a better time to hold a conference to introduce you to the companies, the people, and the ideas that were contributing to the global energy transition. But holding a conference of this size, like finding a solution to decarbonisation, is not easy, and it takes a heck of a lot of teamwork. And we have got a massive uh, effort, a massive teamwork across a number of countries to put together this conference. Everyone has survived. We have thrived with diligence and with good humour. A big thanks to our sponsors, especially our, our, our founding sponsors to Tribeca and Argonaut. Would you put your hands together for them, please? Because they've done a marvellous, marvellous job. I know I've enjoyed listening to the analysis and learning and adding to my knowledge and investing in this area. Thanks so much to the 800 of you that have been online listening, fantastic. I also said at the start that you needed to do your research, pick the right horse for you, and that's why you came. So I hope that with all the knowledge that you have learned over the last few days and the companies that you've met, you've found a horse, maybe even a stable to invest in, and we'd love to hear about it more. Enjoy your last drinks. Stuart, did you want to say any last words before you kick me off the stage back to Australia? Chrissy, um, to the panel, thank you very much. The intelligence on that on that panel is extraordinary. You never find five smarter guys who can talk about the subject. Thank you, Chrissy said the sponsors, but a show like this doesn't happen without exhibitors, delegates, everybody that's turned up. So thank you. It also doesn't happen without my staff. So while you're in the room, I'd like to introduce you and ask you to thank all the AV team at the back of the room for putting on a wonderful job that they've done over the past two days. So give them a round of applause, please. To my staff at the front desk, the registration staff, the people that you've seen, they need a round of applause too, so give them To my event partners and to my wife, Gloria, co-organizer, it's been a fantastic two days. So thank you to all those. And last but not least, I'm going to ask you to all stand. Can you please stand? I want you on your feet. And I'd like you to give a rousing round of applause for the MC of the century, Miss Christina Morrissey. Thank you and goodbye. See you next year.